Good evening, my friends. So nice to see you tonight. Hope everyone is well. I hope Elohim is blessing you. Okay, now I can. I hope Elohim is blessing you, Brother Andrew. You could, uh, you could say that. Okay. I'm not, gonna... not, he's not cursing me, so. No, no, no. I want to open up with a word of prayer tonight. Open the eyes of our hearts, O oh, Father Yahweh. Open the eyes of our understanding. Yet help us to continue to understand, first of all, our foundation in your atoning sacrifice and your ever enduring love and mercy toward us, for which we thank you. Amen. So you've had a good day? Yeah, I uh, was kind of tired, so I was taking a nap before, before we started, but... Uh... I'm, I think I should be fine, though. Good. Good. We've got plenty of questions for you tonight. I was wondering uh, where John or Yokanan had been. Uh, we hadn't seen him for some some weeks. He'll tell uh, you. Dealing, dealing with some family stuff as well, but then one night I wasn't feeling very well. I was a little under oh. the weather. Okay. I mean, I couldn't even... I didn't even really feel like even laying and listening. So it was, yeah. a, bad, it was a bad night. You still <laughs> sound a little bit adult. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just um, a little cold. Or just got, okay. No, I just got to taking one of my bad habits, smoking a cigarette. So uh, mm. <clears throat> sorry. No, I'm, 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 I'm quite relaxed. I, I had a nap as well. So no, I'm good. I'm good. Did you like the right end of the cigarette? Uh, yes, I do. How I do. often are you in a state that you light the wrong end? I don't do that often. I actually have to catch people. Hey, uh, turn that thing around. That's not going to work out <laughs> very well. <laughs> I've done that before a couple times when I smoked. I'll tell you, nothing is worse than that. Almost well, nothing. Luckily, I don't uh, smoke, and uh, so I, I don't carry a lighter around. Because, And I say luckily... I mean, obviously, first for my own health, but secondly, you kind of almost feel a little bit guilty uh, to light someone else's uh, cigarette. Um, so, but because I don't have a lighter, I don't have to run into that issue. I just tell them, no, I don't. Ha I don't have a lighter, and I'm not lying. It's so. You could use that for an evangelism event. I've got a pat podcast up. It's called Cigarette Evangelism. Mm -hmm. Hanging out at the bus stop, mm -hmm. for instance, always before you go to the bus stop, whether you smoke or not, get a, get a pack of those long cigarettes because you're going to have everyone coming around wanting one. Yeah. And uh, you can start up a conversation. It works. I've done it. It so might work. Uh... It's like in church, they use candy evangelism on children. I know or, some churches that, you know, have very fancy stuff to try to oh, lure yeah. people in. Mega churches with with the great lights and... That's how stuff. I first got in there. In the, the donuts and the coffee. Donuts and the coffee, man. The little, the little baby Starbucks set up. <laughs> that's that's what that's what's popular now. Some yeah. churches have cocktail hours after church. Oh yeah. In my case, I went because one of my friends at school, little friend, said, "If you come to church with me, we'll both get a Kennedy half dollar." Uh. I need it. Well, what, are you are you serious about the a cocktail hour after church? Cocktail hour, yeah. Even when I was a youth in the uh, local Presbyterian church. They had cocktail hour after the service. We used, we used to call that. Uh, we, we used to call that the personality improvement seminar. A what? Personality improvement seminar. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's a good. 
Title IV, good thing to do. So Jackson, we had a uh, interesting uh, uh, meeting last week. Really? What meeting was it? You and me, I mean. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was very interesting, I thought. I never listened to them again. You know, I edited them for podcasts and for YouTube, but I'm afraid if I ever listen to one, I'll never do another one. Uh, did you Did you uh, edit? I, I didn't listen to the most recent one yet. Did you edit it uh in any way or you just very listen? little very little on the on the youtube but on the YouTube. i have to edit the podcasts <laughs> yeah <laughs> i've got to take a lot of ums and uhs and clicks and all kinds of stuff well, those are it those are fine i'm just wondering if you uh were Content? planning on airing the whole thing for the uh for the i got to listen show. i don't have I, I, content I, I, no I went, I went, I went ahead and listened to it, and and it doesn't sound like much was edited. And a whole lot of good banter back no. and forth on, the, on the topic of uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. So yes, no, I don't know how much editing would have gone into it, but you I, know, a little controversy that. is good for, good for you when yeah. it comes to bringing other people in. Unfortunately, last time uh, we were kind of tied up with. Um, you're right and I'm wrong kind of thing. We can't do right. that. We that's can't not, do that. That's not what we, well, he, we try yeah, to avoid but, that in these. Yeah, but you said that you had the, the studies and the documentation. And if I would have been on that evening, and pardon my absence, I would have uh, copied and pasted the link to the your pretty much your podcast that I've listened to, mm -hmm. a couple of them over, and, and everything that you present that you can go and look for yourself. So... Um, I, it You're was always up to date, John. You're well, always I was listening. Things. Golly, I wish I would have been there. I would have just sent it here. Look, here's the link. Listen to it, then get back to it. Yeah, exactly. Good event. We, we we love everybody. We we love everybody that was on last week's call. So there's no absolutely. Issue with that. Does anybody know Walter's last name? I forgot. Is it Veith? No, it's not. I've been looking for him. I, w I can't find him, but I want to talk to him. Walter Wright? Like the Seventh-day Adventist I, Walter Oh, Wright? that's the guy you told me about. This Walter, yeah, I know what his last name is. Yeah, no, Walter Wright, the Seventh-day Adventist. That's, that's from right. South Africa. Let's get him so, Um, After, after this week, uh, I was wondering, this was something Jackson and I wanted to do between just me and him, but we didn't really finish it. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe we could open this up to other people. Um, like, probably not today, because we want to give people an opportunity to plan ahead to know when the event would be. Jackson doesn't know what I'm about to say. I'm just telling, you know, coming up with it on the spur of the moment. Basically, uh, we could do like next week or something. We could have instead of the Q and A. Well, it would be like a Q and A type thing, but it would be sort of like Jackson Snyder centric, focused on asking Jackson questions. Um, oh, and I would ask, nice. I would ask a lot of questions too. But basically, we'd be focusing on uh, Jackson's uh, ministry, like the yihad, the goal of his yihad, and maybe Jackson's life story and oh, you know, his Lord. beliefs that's we don't have to do that next week yeah, we, we did it, it once remember onia but it, it was, was you and me one on one and i don't know if what what came of that nothing came of my part of it did you did you not load it to uh, uh, no i didn't load it because I, of, I was ashamed of my part of it i could have done better than that yeah uh, and your we didn't part finish so good we didn't finish mine though, and I, my thought is that if we open it up to everybody else, uh, it could be more interesting, and maybe people have more um, intriguing things to ask about your life story and your beliefs and the overall message that you want to share with the world type of thing. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. either next week or sometime, you know, maybe maybe sometime just in December, we do a Jackson Snyder. Hey. 
focused one. And then sometime after that, like maybe a couple of weeks after or whatever, we do a Onia centric. Uh, and we could do a Laura centric one. We could we could do some of those as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, I actually thought of possibility. I never got around to it yet, but um, like for example, I thought it'd be interesting for my YouTube channel. It doesn't have to be for my YouTube channel. Though. It could be for our group's thing. Um, basically, of like interviewing different people. Like uh, like Laverne, for example, has some really uh cool stuff to share so it'd be kind of cool to have like a video of focusing on his uh message i turned him loose uh back during the feast and he did a real good job you know he's written a book and uh it's a really odd book but there are a lot of really really good facts in there now i've been in ministry since i was five years old I was a child evangelist, <laughs> and in all this time, so many bizarre things have happened, and spiritual things as well. I just never talk about them, except I have this series called Voices, Hearing Voices, 23 parts. Some, t some stuff comes up there where I talk to different people about their views and, and so forth. But, you know, I was thinking if you want to get more people, do a... a YouTube live, um, oh, what's what's it called? Where you schedule it ahead of time? Premiere. Yeah. Yeah. You get a bunch oh, of people on there. What's going on? Who's who's? Uh... My phone's going off. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, I've done YouTube live before. Have you? Yeah. I tried once. So Jackson, you said since since like um. Since five years old, you've been part of the ministry. Yep. Have you um, have you cursed any other children to die? I've cur I, I have prayed some people to die. Yes. Um, have you uh, have you uh, discovered the meaning of the Aleph and the Bet? The alphabet? To some extent, I guess. <laughs> I know <laughs> that if you, I know that if you say the alphabet in school, uh, where's the P? You leave the P out, it's running down your leg. Basically, you know, I, I'm not sure, Jackson, if you're getting my jokes or not. No. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm joking about the, uh, the infancy gospels. Oh, 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 okay. Learning the alphabet, yeah. He yeah, ends up, uh, he ends up teaching the teacher. And did, did you curse any of children to die and things like that? Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> that would be the infancy gospel of Thomas. Yeah. That's pretty wild. Do you, do you include that in your canon? Uh, I do. Um, with, you know, I, I have some uh, arguments to justify it, you know, like, mm -hmm. For example, a lot of the stuff in the infancy gospel, Thomas talks about things happening on the Sabbath. You know, a good religious observant Jew uh, believes, according to the law of Moses, that people are to be put to death on the Sabbath if they mm -hmm. work on the Sabbath or they defile the Sabbath. And uh, a lot of the things that he killed, that he apparently killed people on in, in that document, occurred on the sabbath so mm -hmm. um i think that's telling us something have you ever read a lot of people a lot of people overlook that factor uh -huh. of uh m because most people view the messiah in like the light of christianity outside of the law mm -hmm. so they don't they they don't even look at the sabbath uh portion of the infancy gospel of thomas so. Anyway, I think there's worthwhile saying? historical notes in there, definitely, definitely. I was going to mention the one called Matthias Andrew and the Maneaters. Mm, yeah. I think that's my favorite one. I did a special job on that, and I never heard anything as crazy as that one. That's an apocrypha. It's an early yeah. early piece well, of work that's worth listening to. If you the way I say it, truth is stranger than fiction right uh -huh. here, 
until recently, I was, I was inclined to believe that that episode is from the apocryphal acts of Andrew. But I might be leaning more towards it being from the apocryphal acts of Matthias instead. Um, well, you know, Matthias, it takes a small part in there, but it's called the, uh, the Matthias and the Maneaters. It just has a small part. I would think that's probably right. Because, you know, Acts of Andrew, Acts of Matthias, pieces are spread all over the place. Oh, I did want to share you something. Um, I actually believe that Matthew and Matthias are the same person and that Matthew, like basically I, I think there's a doublet. I think, I think, um, I think uh, according to the Gospel of Luke, the original, the actual name is Levi of the, of the apostle. It's Levi. Yet the other Gospels say Matthew. I think what happened is that there was some confusion by the scribes about the list of the 12, the 12 apostles. Definitely. Because because Matthew or Matthias was added into the 12 apostle list to replace Judas Iscariot. So I believe that uh, Matthias, a.k.a. Matthew, wrote the Gospel of Matthew, but that Matthew was never one of the 12 apostles. Instead, Levi is one of the 12 apostles, and the scribes got confused and added Matthew slash Matthias into the text. And then, and then they started distinguishing between a Matthew and Matthias as if they were two different individuals. But I think, I think it was just the one, Matthias or Matthew. And then the one that they combined to create Matthew the Apostle was originally Levi the Apostle. That's my theory. I think you're probably right. You know, if if Le Levi was a Levite, he would be a fitting candidate for a tax collector's office. And another one that is really very interesting to get into like that is Judas, Toma, Thomas, Thutis, Thaddeus, and right. the brother of Yahshua. All those different names can be applied to this one guy. Well, what's interesting of uh, the, the Matthew one is, you know, the traditional authorship of the Gospel of Matthew is Matthew. But um, for some strange reason, Matthew's talking about himself in the third person. Mm -hmm. Never never refers to himself in the first person. If Matthias is the one who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he wouldn't be writing in the first person because he wasn't involved uh, in those stories. Uh, he wasn't one of the 12 apostles. Um, Gospel of Luke, he doesn't write in the first person because Luke was not one of the apostles. Gospel of Mark, he doesn't write in the first person because he's not one. But the Gospel of John, whoever he was, you know, traditional authorship is John, but basically it's the, the disciple whom he loved or whatever, the, the beloved disciple. He writes in the first person. I think that would be Lazarus when you come. Yeah, to there's different theories. Uh, I Lazarus. Think Lazarus fits that bill, but you know the names, as you know, of the Gospels. Probably the complete Gospels were attached as late as the second century, middle of second century. So scholars say so. The Gospel of Peter cla claims to be by Peter, first person. Gospel of Thomas claims to be by Thomas. Um, yeah, a couple of them do. But, uh, and then the Gospel of Hebrews, apparently, it claims to be uh, by Matthew, according to some of the church fathers. We don't know for sure, because we don't have a surviving copy of the Gospel of Hebrews. But it may very well be that the Gospel of Hebrews was written by Levi. Uh, it, maybe it claims to be written by Levi, and then the scribes conflated it, like I said, uh, so... Gospel of Matthew would be by Matthias. Gospel of Hebrews would be by Levi. The reason I say that is because in the Neg Hammadi Library, 
there's a couple of writings which basically say that the apostles all got together and they wrote their own accounts of what happened when the Messiah was on the earth and did his ministry. So they basically wrote their own, each of them wrote their own gospel. So like where are the gospels? Uh, well, Nazarene Act says that James kept all those things in a vault someplace. I would love to see like the gospel of the Hebrews, the gospel of Peter, some of the other ones come to light like the Nag Hammadi texts. I mean, they open a tomb someplace and there they are. You know, those Oxyrhynchus papyri that are so important, some of the earliest gospel pieces that we have, were found stuffed inside a thousand dead crocodiles. There's, there's a lot of, I didn't know that, but there's a lot of gospel fragments, which I believe a lot of those gospel fragments are from the Gospel of Hebrews and Gospel of Peter. There, there are some striking similarities with some of these gospel fragments and the Gospel of Peter. Um, and I suspect some of these other fragments are, are from Gospel of Hebrews as well. That's my theory. <laughs> Well, lately here, they, they were talking about this paper mache mask out of Egypt, that part of that mask was the earliest copy of Mark in yeah. existence, an Egyptian ceremonial mask, but nobody can look at it because the owner of it got a hold of it, put it away. Same with those uh, iron codices. What, what do they call those? Jordan codices. We can't even look at those because the owners of those put them away. Won't let you see them. That is selfish. You can't eat it. You can't sell it. You can't read it. What? I want to put it away here so nobody else can. It's like the dog in a manger. You can't eat the straw or hay, and he won't let the oxen do it either. Now, what gospel does that come from? Uh, Proto-Evangelium. Maybe. Or Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, as they call it. The Book of Homonomines. Homonomines. I, I can't remember anymore. You looking for a question, or do you think somebody has one? Um, what, whatever uh, people, if people want on the call want to share their questions, that'd be cool. Okay. Um, as an aside, I recently have read about some new books on Hebrew or Dead Sea Scroll uh, grammar, which I'll be buying soon. Uh, it's important for my, my uh, translation project to learn how the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, differed from the Biblical Hebrew. Absolutely. But th those are new books straight from the press, uh, 2020 books, so they're expensive. The okay. one is... Uh, 90 euros so uh does brill publish them or who's the publisher i think it's brill but it's S sbl affiliated sbl society of biblical literature yes that's probably brill they, they their books are by scholars and they're so expensive is that you can't even get a handle on hang you can't get a handle on it unless you're willing to turn in your 401k <laughs> all right so let's see Trying to find a good one. Oh, this is this is pretty wacky. Does the Zohar say that Om is one of God's names? Is that in in uh, our fence in our corral here, or should we go on? I have not read the Zohar, so I cannot. Uh, okay. Comment on that. I have an answer to it. Yeah, you share yours. Well, it's hardly worth it, I don't think. Let's see. Well, Om, you know, I think Om is, uh, you know, what people say when they meditate. But uh... I'll take a shot and say no. I did write an answer to this. Thing. There is some esoteric literature that assign names to the deity. I have the Zohar and read it, but can't come up with Om. Elohim has only one name by his own admission, and that name is yod Hey vav Hey, usually pronounced Yahweh or Yahuwah or something similar. Is it, though? Well, I don't know. All because we, we because 
We can only go back to about 300 BC on that. What well, you when, you, when you look at uh, the Exodus account, instead of saying, when, he, when, he, when, he, when Moses asked what his name is, instead of telling him that his name is yod heh mm -hmm. he says, uh, Yeah, he says, Aleph, yod Hey, yo, no, he I said, don't know. I don't know what it is, but basically, he doesn't say. Uh, er, was I, he says a, er, a, y, I, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I am that I am. And then you never is, see that ever again in scripture. No, for but then a little ways down, he says, Yahweh is my name, or however you want to pronounce it. Somebody tried to tell me that was an interpolation. Somebody told me that that that, that, that uh, verse fifteen was. Verse 15 that says Yod Hey Wahe. Uh huh. They said that they, somebody said that that was at. Now, I have not been able to wadire him as to where he got that from. Well, but I don't know I how. They, that it, is. it depends on what book he's looking at because, like, I, I got the book here recently, The Authentic Paul, which takes out all the interpolations and retranslated in modern language it's really good and to find out mm -hmm. all the interpolations of that book uh as determined by the jesus seminar is astounding taking those things out then reading paul you get a whole different viewpoint of paul see like um, about the divine name, I just want to say, I, I've touched on, on this before, but um, it is my belief that uh, he does not really have a name and that he chose specific names to reveal himself to people yeah. to, to help them understand who he is. So, like, for example, he appears to the patriarchs as El Shaddai. That, that conveyed who he was. Uh, you, you might see sometimes him be El Elyon, Most High, uh, the Most High El. And so I believe, based on my studies, that Yahweh was originally a uh, Aya, or Aya, and that it actually comes from the Babylonians, the Akkadians, and and that the name Aya or Aya is itself originates from the Sumerians, the Sumerian language. So if I'm right, uh, Elohim decided to choose for himself the name of the Sumerian deity uh, as pronounced by the Babylonians to reveal himself to Israel and Egypt. Um, I certainly think that's possible because he's try he tries to help people understand who he is. So, so let's say, you know, you know how Paul said in, uh, in, the in the book of Acts, he talks about the unknown God and he says, you worship the unknown God, and I'm going to reveal who that unknown God is along those lines. In the same way, I think Elohim chose to do a similar process where the Babylonians worshipped a, a God named Ea, and Elohim appeared to Moses and said, I am, I am Ea, I am the God that the Babylonians worship. And I Ea, Esher, Ea, just came to me. Yeah, a a a Escher, a a. So you but think I, it's like a, 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 a evolution of names, one popping on after the other as different cultures come into this? Yeah, basically, I believe the original was Enki Escher, a a. Instead of instead of Ash uh, instead of a a Asher, a a. Mm -hmm. I think it's Enki Asher, a a. And the reason Egypt. is. The reason I think this is because um, in Sumerian, the god's name is Enki, and then the Akkadian version is Ea. But if you look in Hebrew, the Hebrew language, and this works for Akkadian as well, 
in the Hebrew language, Aya means I am, right? Or Aya means I am. Yeah. But guess what? Guess what Anaki means? Same thing? It means I. It, it, and if you and it, and there's no there's no am in Hebrew like you don't you don't say he is yeah uh, this there's no am is uh -uh. no verb in there so anaki is a synonym of aya so I believe the Akkadians saw the Sumerian word uh, enki. And did a folk etymology and replaced Enki with the, what they thought was the Hebrew word or the Akkadian word I, Anaki, and they replaced it with uh, Aya, which, and so they basically replaced it with, they replaced what they thought was I, the word for I, they replaced with the word I am. I think that's the origin. Oh, that's a good theory. It makes sense. I gotta, I gotta write like a whole PDF about it because it's, it's, it's uh, more compelling when you see it in in writing. I think. But anyway, so yeah, that, good, good. That that wasn't really the question. So sorry for the tangent. Well, that's all right. I would find about everything, but all my think you know some uh, pseudepigrapha talk about his name being 72 letters long, and another one says it's 264 letters long. And uh, what his name is, who can say? I think the, the only reason that he has a name given is to relate him or herself to people, because people have names. It's a good thing his name isn't like Bill or Bob or Lenore. Um, Vicky was asking if I posted that PDF. Uh, I was saying I should make a PDF. I have not made a PDF of that. Um, it, it would be a good idea to make it so that people could see what I'm talking about written out. Um, another thing that I touched upon is uh, how Elohim, I don't believe, is originally an authentic term and that it was, it was created by the Israelites in an attempt to eradicate the multiple gods in the ancient Hebrew religion, because you, you know where it, it says uh, Yahweh is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and God of Gods. So there's many gods, but there's only one God we are to worship. The Israelites were to worship the one God, Yahweh, and they instead they were worshiping many other lesser gods when they were only supposed to worship the one lesser god Yahweh. Well, and, you know that uh, name goes back to 3000 BC and the Eblet tablets is full of El or Elohim and lesser Yah is in there as well but in much, much less frequency so that really goes back too so maybe they use that to consolidate everything. You're saying that the Eblet tablets yeah. It was was when? Two thousand to three thousand BC. I thought they date the Ebla tablets much later. Oh wait, Ebla tablets. Oh, wait. is that the same as the Ama Amarna? No, they're different. Oh, they're different. Okay. Yeah, they're from the same general area, where they found cuneiform uh, multitudes of cuneiform tablets. There, and this is pretty recently. There's a book by the author that translates some of them, or the general translator. I can't call his name right now. Um, I want to just recommend you to anyone listening right now, because you, you'll you'll see this on video. Um, I'm going to pull up a book. I want to recommend people to buy this because it's mind blowing. Uh, what you can learn from it. So one sec. I'm going to take my headphones off so I can't hear you for a sec. All right. It would be nice of him because he doesn't believe in copyrights just to make us all a copy. A okay. This book. An Akkadian Lexical Companion for Biblical Hebrew. Mm. Etymological, semantic, and I can't read backwards. The, my computer screen has it backwards. Uh, 
an idiomatic equivalence with settlement on biblical Aramaic. So basically, you look up a word, a Hebrew word, and it'll tell you the Akkadian uh, equivalent. And Give us a good example. Um, yeah. Well, like, uh, so for example, the word for Messiah, I'm just telling you off the top of my head, the word for Messiah in Akkadian, instead of, in, I'm going to type it too. So, um, so, uh, so that's uh, Messiah in Hebrew, right? Well, in, uh, so it's Messiah, that, that's the Hebrew word Messiah, or Mesha. So the, the Aya is like a uh, extra yo that they add in. But really, it, it should it should be like Masha or Mashe. So the the Akkadian word instead of Masha, it is it is uh, Pashish. Pashish. Or it's or it's basically it's it's Pashish and Pash. Uh, pashish. And it looks like they're unrelated, but they're actually related. They're the same root word. They're just, um, uh, they are uh, spelled different. And um, there's all kinds of crazy examples like that. There's um, like, uh, let's see here. Um, Levi, like, I don't know. There's just so many amazing examples uh, where, like, there's just striking things. Um, well, you sometimes it's it. the same word. Other times, like, it's the same word, but it's in a very different order. Like, uh, like, um, like the letters are switched around sometimes. So. Keep us up to date on it as you go through. I will. Um, I'll maybe make some videos too in the future. Okay. You Anyways, ready? You ready? give a question. Give a question. New Testament. What? Ready to go to the New Testament? For a question? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go I'm right ahead. Back, I'm going to back to June on questions. So okay. Did June? I didn't know we had questions from June. Oh, I have. These questions all came to me in the last. Wait, I just remember, I remembered one more. I got to share with you guys. I've shared this before, but I have to share this one, okay? And then we'll go to June question. But seriously, we, we had June questions? You never said this. No, we've gotten clear back from the whole last year. Oh, wow. Um, basically, you know the word uh, for blessed in Hebrew, Baruch? Well, in Akkadian, the word for bless is Kareb. And it is literally the same word as cherub. So what we what we learn from Akkadian is that the word for bless and the word for cherub come from the same root word. And cherubs are actually uh, beings of blessing. Uh, the the angelic cherubim are uh, basically spiritual beings of blessing. And One, we learn that from Akkadian. Does a cherub in Hebrew kariv mean? Yeah, kariv. Uh, Akkadian, it's b uh, both bless and okay. the being is the same uh, word. All right, enough of that. Uh, June questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Did Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, know Jesus was God? And if so, how did she treat him? compared to his other half-brothers and sisters. Now, that the person that answered that question maybe ought to look a little closer at the that, text. That asked the question? Did Mary, mother of Jesus Christ, know Jesus was God? And if so, how did she treat him compared right. to his other half-brothers and sisters? Let's start with the first part. Did Mary know Jesus was God? You want to take that? Um, I could share my thought on it. I, uh, it. Basically, you have to figure out what 
does the person mean when they say, did, did she know that he was God? Because... Um, Just take it at its face value. That's all we know is what the question is. Well, it sounds like what they're saying is, you know, God Almighty and things like that. And uh, That's what they mean. So uh, I don't believe that uh, he claimed to be Almighty God. Um, so Mary, well, certainly she did not know who he was, at least uh, in the beginning of the ministry, because she treated him like a normal human being, right? So evidently there was not this understanding of of him being uh, the Almighty God. Um, I think a, a lot of the high view of the Messiah comes later, but I do believe, I believe that uh, the Son of God, the Divine Son of God came down from heaven. I believe in that. I just think that um, it wasn't clear to everybody who he really was. So I don't think really Mary was fully comprehended the glory that was being revealed uh, to the earth. Okay. What about you, Jackson? Okay, I, I would say no for several reasons. First of all, um, even Jesus never claimed to be God. In fact, he dichotomizes himself from God many times. That teaching really only became codified there in the fourth century that Jesus Christ was God, because, you know, those Romans and those councils, they were used to that kind of thing. I think that Mary, if she was righteous, and I, I rather doubt, as many do today, uh, first two chapters of Matthew, first two chapters of Luke, they're so different from the rest of the narrative. I don't really think we know a whole lot about that, but certainly... If she was an observant Jew, an Essene maybe, uh, she would have thought that a man being God, even her own child, was not a possibility, would not even come to mind. I know somebody who said that, who was pregnant and said that her son, when he came out, was going to be the Messiah. She's got a revelation of that. She told everybody about that every place. And of course, what came out was a girl. <laughs> so she, she thought that she probably got that one wrong. And the next one that came out was a girl. Finally, on the third try, the boy came out. Now he's the Messiah. I think, like you said, Mary treated him just as a child. Now, the second part of this, how did she treat him compared to his other half-brothers and sisters? My theory on that is a little different than most people. I don't, I believe that her husband was mature and that at least two, if not two of those that are designated as his brothers, were came with Joseph when he came over from Egypt and were already there. One or two are designated in other places as his cousins. And at that time, the cousins were all brought up together in the same place. So I'm talking about Shimon Bar Klopa, who's also called Simon the Zealot. That was a cousin because he's called Simon the Canaanian, he was of Cana, a little village right next door to Nazareth. So I, I think if you look at a modern family with a young mother that has stepchildren that may be just as old as her, James would have been as old as her or maybe a little older even, these guys were primarily on their way or already in adulthood. The tradition tells us that James was a priest for life and that his, that his twin brother Jude was a, a worker with 
their father. And so I don't think that she had that much to do with them until later on when Jesus was 30 years old and, and in, in his prime, these were older brothers and sisters that already were independent, already had their careers and so forth. And don't forget that according to the Gospel of Thomas and lots and lots of tradition, that the one brother, Yaakov or James the Just, was Yahshua's designated successor. So I, I, that also has to do, let me say one more thing, underneath the cross, when uh, Mary was there with some other one, you know, people like James Tabor says, well, that was James who she was with because if Joseph was dead, James was the was the elder brother and that he would under Roman and Jewish law take over as guardian or milpha in Aramaic of the stepmother. So who else would be there with the women beneath the cross but James? I think they had a very close relationship and I don't think that they believed that Jesus was God. I believe that really came along much, much, much later when the Romans got involved and the Catholic Church was formed. I think that he was divine, is my opinion, but rather than being, as the Trinitarian formula says, the same substance as Elohim, well, obviously, he was not the same substance because Elohim is a spirit and Yahshua was a man. So um, I, I don't believe in that Trinity doctrine. I believe that he was the son of Elohim and the son of man, which he called himself over 150 times in the Gospels, that he was the son of man. What that means, well, you can't really figure what that means unless you read the book of Enoch, where several chapters there specifically tells us what that title means. That's my answer to it. What do you think? Do you, do you have faith in the uh, nativity narratives? I think you probably do. I do, but uh, the Proto-Evangelium kind of mostly agrees with what you just said. I mean, in the sense of, um, in the sense of the siblings being already, uh, already alive and not really born from Mary, but from someone else. Um, but uh, I, I do have a question of what you said. Now, when you said you believe he was divine, can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, sure. Because it's a very unclear way to say it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, uh, because we don't have the time or the interest. Ah, uh, shoot, wait a minute. We don't have the time and interest to go into what the title Son of Man means, except to say that the Son of Man was in the line of Melchizedek, Metatron, Enoch. That spirit person who had the spiritual propensity as a son of Elohim to be a mediator between Elohim, who couldn't be seen, and humankind as well as angels. And as I said, the middle chapter, the parables of Enoch tell all about this. And if you didn't know any better, you would think that knowing the mission and acts of Yahshua, definitely a second Adam is a son of man. It might even be called that. If you, if you didn't know that Enoch was much earlier than Yahshua, you would say Yahshua is in this text because it is so pre it is so similar to Yahshua's life as we know it and to the title that he called himself. So when I say divine, he had the ability to move beyond the mundane realm that we live in and are stuck in, 
unless we're some kind of mystic, in order to be in a transfiguration type situation or in the situation as a judge of angels and humanity. Um, that is a characteristic of what the Son of Man is, according to Enoch. Now, to try to explain it any further, I simply can't. I just know, without a doubt, that Elohim and Yahshua are not the same, according to Yahshua's own word. word. And he describes himself perfectly. In fact, in the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark, the supposedly the earliest gospel, uh, arguably, it starts out by saying the Toledot, or history of Yahshua HaMashiach, the son of Elohim, Ben Elohim. It's a, still a mystery. I don't know if we can understand it until we're able to get on that other side. My take on it is uh, I believe that uh, a father is the ultimate God and then that uh, Yahweh was a lesser God and Yahweh is, the ch is like the chief son, the chief son of Elohim. And basically is my understanding that Yeshua is Yahweh, but Yeshua is not uh, the Father. Yeshua is not uh, Elohim, the the ultimate uh, deity. He is the he is the lesser one uh, who serves uh, the Father. Yeah, well, Yahweh is a, is like a war god in in the in the Old Testament. Whenever there's warfare to be done, he's Yahweh Saviot. And when when we read in Revelation about Yeshua there, he takes that exact same mm -hmm. position. He's going to take out the sword of his mouth and slay every evil thing that ever lived. Good. Now, now the Son of Man thing, I'm a little conflicted on because I, I've been citing that as evidence of, for the Book of Enoch for a long time. Uh, from the New Testament, the connection there seems striking, right? Yeah. Um, but I've I've kind of been, taken a more critical look at the New Testament in the sense of some of these phrases and oh yeah, um, it's my view that a lot of these times the Messiah would have been speaking in the first person of, when he's talking about himself. So he wouldn't have said "Son of Man" in some of these passages. Uh, so it's not clear to me which which references to Son of Man are authentic and which are not. Like. Because, for example, I, I found, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I found at least one place where one gospel says Son of Man and the other does not. Um, That's so redaction. What was it? Redaction criticism you're doing there. Uh, uh, yeah, there's variants like that. But I've also found things like, um, I'll, I'll mention a couple, like uh, Matthew 8, 20, uh, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no other lay head. The, uh, the translators capitalize those words, Son mm -hmm. of Man. But it could easily be talking about regular human beings yeah. uh, because it says foxes, birds, so it could then be meaning humans. Um, and, then, and then likewise, Matthew 9, 6, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. He may have actually been saying, But that you that you may know that humans have power on earth to forgive sins. And and um and then another one, uh uh Matthew twelve eight, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He may have been saying humans are uh uh, lords of the Sabbath, but using it in the singular, mankind. Well, you know, the new revised standard version, the whole translation, is based on what you say. They have replaced Son of Man, um, Ben Adam, with human being throughout mm. the scripture. I think that's going pretty far. To tell yeah. you. What translation? New revised standard version. They try to make it... Um, 
gender friendly, gender inclusive. Mm, right. In order to do that, son of man just becomes human being. Oh, I, I got another one that's weird. Matthew sixteen thirteen says, like, okay, so you know how the son of man, the Enoch phrase, is like this divine being, right? In the book, in the book of Enoch, the son of man. Well, Matthew sixteen thirteen says. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It doesn't make sense. Like, he, he, he's, he's asking them, who do they say I am? And he's telling them who he is. But the, the context of that chapter is, like, he's asking them, who, who am I? Uh, but at least the way the verse reads, it sounds like he's telling them who he is and asking them who he is, which doesn't make sense. Well, let's look at that verse real quick because that's important. It's in uh, four, 13. 16. Chapter 16, verse 13. Okay. This, I got the NIV that just popped up. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Just is that simple. Oh, ver verse 15. Who do you say that I am? But verse 13, it says, Who do oh. men say that? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 13. Verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? The, huh. New, King James, the New King James Version says, uh, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I don't know if that's uh, what the actual text says or if they differ, because I know that the King James Version was used from a different New Testament Greek text than the NIV was sometimes. It uses, it uses the Stephanos, which only goes back to 1550. You know, we got so many much better texts now than they did at that time. Right. So that could be the explanation for the difference, or it could just be NIV is translating freely, uh, like they do sometimes. You know, at that particular place, he's standing at Banias in front of the cave of Baal, the mouth of Baal there, where Pan was worshipped. And you can still see that today. The idea was that the fallen angels came down on the top of Mount Hermon, went clear through the mountain and came out the bottom and made a big cave there. That's right outside of Caesarea Philippi. And to see that thing today, look it up sometime. To see that thing today, it's astounding. You can see all the niches there for the various gods. The gods aren't there anymore. But even the name of the place is Banias, Pan's place. So, you know, he's in the midst of all these people worshiping here at this great big old cave that looks like the mouth of the devil, actually, where the evil angels came down and came through. And he's asking them that question in that place. That's significant. I, I'm surprised they just don't mention it here. You, so you know how the Gospels are the synoptic Gospels, how they say the same passage but have differences? Yeah, sure. Gospel of Luke, I actually prefer Gospel of Luke over Matthew the majority of the time. Um, and in the Gospel of Luke, it says in the same exact passage, and it happened as he was alone praying, his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Matthew version says, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, so there's, uh, of course, Matthew is a fuller, fuller, like if you read the Matthew version, there's, there's a good amount more, uh, like in, uh, in like uh, Peter gives his answer and then it says, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it and I will give you the keys, all oh, blah, blah, blah. That's not in Gospel of Luke. So Matthew's a fuller text, but consistently Matthew adds these clarifiers that Luke does not, and the clarifiers seem to be uh, of a later age, in my opinion. Okay, Steve's got a question for you in the chat. Who was it? 
Steve, Tower Time? I don't see it in the chat. Really? Oh, oh, oh you typed it uh, for him. I'm going to say yes to that. Was Bell and the Dragon part of the original Codex Sinaiticus? I'm going to say yes. Is it? Is it? It's not currently in the Codex Sinaiticus. Well, it, it. All I did was the New Testament in the Sinaiticus to show the the uh, different interpolations that weren't weren't there at that time. It would be in the apocryphal section of the Codex Sinaiticus in the Daniel section, of course, Greek Daniel. So let's find out for sure. Let's see. Um, I'm looking it up now. If you haven't read the Greek Daniel parts that are in the Apocrypha, there's some really interesting texts in there. Bell and the Dragon, the Three Children, the Prayer of Azariah, uh, let's see, Judith, that's not part of Daniel, but and Susanna and the Judges. Very interesting stuff. So um, Wikipedia is confusing. It doesn't really give a full list uh, of the books. So, I mean, but there is an actual website for the whole Codex Sinaiticus. So, let's see. It says, well, here's something. Uh, let's see. Bible was, training. Uh, I'm going to the actual Codex Sinaiticus itself. Um, so, by the looks of it, I'm not seeing Daniel anywhere. So, it appears that um in there you see it there oh i know that daniel daniel is in there it's not showing on the website i don't see it because what i know is that um some of this some it, like it was a copy of the bible but parts of it were missing like um it says it actually says on wikipedia it says while large portions of the Old Testament are missing, okay. it is assumed that the Codex originally contained the whole of both Testaments. For its Codex Vaticanus, which I think preserves the entire Old Testament. Yeah, probably. But Vaticanus, uh, apparently, like part of the Old Testament was torn off and it had to be replaced by a later scribe. Uh, if I understand, if I remember correctly. Here's an answer on here. Where? where I'm looking right now. Uh, but um, I don't believe that Bell and the Dragon was originally part of the Septuagint uh, version of Daniel, in my opinion. Okay. I think it was added early on uh, from, a, from another Apocrypha book, from a Habakkuk Apocrypha. Bell and the Dragon is a fascinating story that comes from the 14th chapter of the Greek version of Daniel. They're found in the Septuagint and in Theodosian second century revision of the same. Let's see if there's, it doesn't say anything about the Sinaiticus here. Boy, that's a good question. And I uh, the, the, the link for the uh, full website, um, you actually could. It, it's le it's actually referenced on uh, Wikipedia itself, but I'll I'll post it uh, as well. Right. Um, so the link is codexsinaiticus.org, English website, and um, I do have a question uh, for you, Jackson, because this is something I've been thinking about, and I'm. I do have I do have a question eventually. So okay, let's I'll, you go first. Then go first. No. Oh, go ahead and knock yours out. Mine's going to be uh, um, probably. But. Your, yours is probably going to be what? It, it's going to be quite interesting and it's going to require some explanation. So I don't know. Just um, go ahead and knock yours out. Type. Can you type your question first? I'd, I, I'd rather not. It's a okay. Bit All right. Uh, basically, my question is um, for 
uh, I've been uh, compared like the Nazarene Acts. Okay, the account of James' death. Well, the Nazarene Acts doesn't uh, describe James' death. Yeah. Basically, James' death does not reconcile between Josephus and um, no and Nazarene Acts. So, how do you uh, reconcile apparent discrepancies? between Josephus and scripture? Well, yeah, first of all, the account in the Nazarene Acts, Clementine, so James isn't killed. He's left for dead with his legs broken and his followers carry him off to Jericho. So he survives and comes back to be, to be thrown off the parapet of the temple, beat with a club and buried in 62 AD. Josephus, as far as James, Josephus says that James was stoned. And that is true, that when he hit the ground, he was still alive, according to Eusebius. And that they stoned him there and it still couldn't kill him until a fuller comes over and hits him on the head with a baseball bat. Another account says they stoned him then they dug a hole for him with just his head stuck, sticking out. And then the fuller comes along with a golf club, probably a one wood, and dispatches James with that. And it also says that, uh, Jos was it Josephus? Oh, I can't remember for sure, but he was buried right there where he was killed right along the steps of the temple. Where that, you know where that Zechariah pyramid is? I'm right? not sure. Okay, it's a very outstanding kind of monument there in Jerusalem. And his grave site is right there. So does that answer your question? I, I don't think there's a need to reconcile. Um, well, okay, so for example, um, according to Nazarene Acts, that whole temple incident when Paul was uh, attacking him, that was before Paul supposedly converted, right? Well, Paul apparently supposedly converted very early on, like, uh, I don't know, seven years after or something. So, like, around four, 40 AD, which is a good which is a good 20 years before. Um, so, here's my theory, which I've come upon recently. Okay, there's okay. another theory, too, but go ahead with yours and I'll tell you. My theory is that um, Josephus never mentioned uh, uh, James and that he was actually talking about someone else. Uh, he was talking about a different... James, who is the brother of a different Jesus, uh, because because uh, Jesus, because um, in Greek, Jesus is the form of Joshua, and there uh, Josephus uh, actually mentions other people named Jesus or Joshua. Uh, quite a few. Who, uh, quite a few, and in that very section, um, like not in that very section, but in that general section. There's actually close proximity reference to another Jesus who is not the Messiah. Yeah, um, son of Dominus. Yeah, so I'm inclined to think. I know like the early the early uh, Christians would not like this because I'm taking away one of their early Christian references to authenticate the New Testament. But I actually think that it does more harm than good to the New Testament testimony because it creates this very difficult contradiction which is not necessarily necessitated by uh what Josephus says it, it could very well be a completely different jesus completely different james and then christians just wanted it so much to be a reference to the to their beloved james and to their beloved jesus that they interpreted it that way right. and that's my theory okay i have to disagree with that that's okay. The, the story about James' death and Josephus comes on the tail of the story of Paul and his brother, called their Solace. And it says that Solace and his, his brother, Costabarus, which may well be Bar, Barnabas, I don't know, Costabarus, were related to the Herodians, which we've already figured out from Romans 16 that Paul was a Herodian. 
So it says that they raised hell around the temple all the time to the point where uh, when they tried to apprehend that gang, Paul's gang, they were they were caused not to because of their uh, relation to the king. Okay, right after that sequence is the sequence of James' death. They're, they're very much related. I don't know any scholar that says that that is uh, spurious, but there's one other point to be made right now in a discovery or a theory that is very intriguing that in Josephus, the story of the Egyptian, spoken of in Acts 6, that the Egyptian is Yahshua. He comes out of Egypt, and that there is actually a 20-year difference between Josephus' accounts and the New Testament accounts, consistently between a number of different incidents that are mentioned in both. And the theory is that for some reason, the Bible, or I should say the writer of the Acts of the Apostles and Luke, predated the gospel back 20 years in order. What was the reason? There's a good reason. I'd, I'd have to think about it a little bit. I haven't looked at this for a while. But if you compare Josephus and the Acts that are mentioned there, and the Gospel of Luke, the same acts that are mentioned there, consistently a 20-year uh, time shift. Now, Jesus as the Egyptian makes a lot of sense because he says he brings a band in and his intention is to go up on Mount Zion and that they go to Mount Zion in the Mount of Olives with the Egyptian with his followers we get clues from the New Testament that Yosef and Yahshua were both out of Egypt. And um, with the time shift, it all works out just to the year. And so that's something that's worth looking at too, the Egyptian, because he does exactly what Yahshua does. Just as Thutis in Josephus and in Acts 6 does just exactly like the brother of Yahshua Jude. Now, there could, of course, be a conspiracy here, either on the end of Josephus or on Luke's end. It would be more consistent to me that if Luke was doing this, because Luke obviously has had to disguise the people that he's talking about with a variety of names, because in that day, to write that literature and get caught as the author of it, you got the same pen penalty as the criminals in there. That was a capital offense to be an author of such material. And so Luke, of course, is a pseudonym. Uh, Theophilus is a pseudonym. Many others in there are pseudonyms, like you said in Acts chapter 1, Matthias. I agree with you on that. And, you know, there's a reason I do, but I won't go into that now. But it's intriguing, to say the least. That's why I'm working on the translation of the Aramaic Slavonic Josephus, which talks a lot more about the biblical characters. It was written in Aramaic for Jews. He, he rewrote it in Greek for Greeks and Romans, and he left a lot of stuff out primarily stuff about the movement that we today call Jewish Christianity. Amen. <laughs> Which God. leads into my next question. Go ahead and talk about the discrepancy between John the, the time the time frame of John the Baptist possibly being younger than Yeshua or lived longer, according to Josephus. Because doesn't Josephus in the Greek version talk about a man and... Yeah, Banya. And a man... Yeah, and so... Yes, yeah, so I was wondering what your views are about the discrepancy possibly in the time frame of this description of Yochanan the Immerser by Josephus being running around at a later time after Mashiach. All right, I think that I'll go ahead since I'm on a roll here, Oni. <laughs> I think that um, Josephus talks about 
John the Baptist calls him in the Slavonic version the wild man. The wild man in Jesus is known as the wonder worker. So the uh, book of Luke has John the Baptist being six months older than Yahshua and a kinsperson. However, Josephus talks about a man who he hung out with. He was a disciple of another guy named Banya. Banya simply means one who baptizes. Okay, so Josephus left Banya because it was just too hard for him as a 17-year-old man to follow that way. And he says specifically that this guy was an Essene. Whether he was Qumranian or not, I don't know. So that Banya could, could well be John the Baptist. But Josephus also says that John the Baptist was alive like 30 years after Yahshua, or is it 30 years before? He actually tells about his lifespan. And his lifespan in Josephus. In what, in what section? I am just going off the top of my head with this. I think it's in his Wita. His so what we do know is according to uh, uh, um, Book 18 of the Antiquities of the Jews. Right. Um, it places his, it seems to place his death in the same uh, time frame that the Gospels place it. Uh, so at least for the death. 62 it, is what. It, but did you go right before that and see about Saul breathing his murder? Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm referring to uh, John the Baptist uh, section. Oh, oh okay. So, yes, um, basically in that section, it, um, it mentions... Uh, Aretas and Herod mm -hmm. and apparently this Herod is uh, the same Herod that the New Testament speaks about um, well, the same I, chronological. It would be, it would be um, Herod Agrippa who Herod Agrippa just had like two or three years and that was taken over by Agrippa the second the young man I'm trying to think of the dates I think that Agrippa died in 63, 64. It might be 20 years off there because of the time shift. Well, it claims on Wikipedia that uh, the Herod Antipas uh, is the one who uh, killed John the Baptist. Um, yeah, that would have been much earlier. Well, Her Herod uh, Antipas or Antiper and uh, Antipater, uh, it's it says he died. Uh, he died after 39 A.D., um, but he his reign ended in 39 A.D. Um, from what I can tell, based on what I'm looking at, there doesn't seem to be a discrepancy in the di in the. Uh, in the date of the death of John the Baptist uh, and the New Testament. But uh, if you can find, I'm not sure about the earlier portion of uh, the life of John the Baptist. And I also don't know, I don't remember what Slavonic Josephus says either. Um, Slavonic has a lot about him and a lot of description that the other doesn't have. But uh, I just wanted to mention here about while we're at it, no, I forgot what it was. That's all right. Go well, another, another thing I want to say about the Josephus thing, I think, for example, the, uh, you know, the, the whole controversial census of Chironius, um, yeah. which uh, appears to contradict what the Gospel of Luke says. You know, the Gospel of Luke says that census was much earlier than what Josephus says. Exactly. Here's what my belief on that is. My belief is that the original of Gospel of Luke simply said uh let's see let me go to it uh so what our current text of luke says for the census is it says it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from caesar augustus that all the world should be registered 
This census first took place while Karanas was governing Syria. Yeah, that's wrong. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. I believe one of two things, or yeah, one of two things. Either verse 2 is an entire interpolation and was not originally part of the Gospel of Luke, or, um, no, nah, that's pretty much what I think, I think. Uh, Makes a lot of date mistakes. Again, look at Acts 6. He's got, um, he's got Judas the Galilean. He's got right, right. Judas and I, I think the Gospel of I think the uh, Gospel of Luke and Acts by a later scribe used Josephus uh, as a uh, like to uh, add some chronological things in that they thought was what it was saying. So that um, you're talking about something that had to happen in the mid '90s at the earliest. Because right. The references in Josephus are, that are the same. Are, well, he, he was probably murdered by his cousin Domitian in about 95, along with Clement of Rome and several other guys mentioned in the Bible, Epaphroditus, another one. So uh, he would get his antiquities out sometime just before 95. So that means that if Luke used Josephus, then the redactor had to be looking at a copy in 95 or later. On the other hand, the other theory goes that Josephus used Luke. And this is another reason why I believe that Luke is really Epaphroditus, who was martyred in 95 AD. A literary man, a book writer, he's the one that Josephus dedicated his works to, and he is mentioned by Paul as being a traveler with him in Philippians chapter 2. So it's, it's all a great mystery. It's, it's fun. And it would be my hope that sometime we'd find out about these things. Why? Does it have anything to do with our faith? Seems to me the more I learn, the more critical my scholarship is, insofar as I'm able. My it's, faith, a it, it's a salvation issue. My if, you, if you don't know the truth, you, uh, you'll you be damned to hell for eternity. Yeah. Along with 99. <laughs> other people. Okay. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, I'm, I've, I've blown on too long. You want another question? Um, uh, I did want to say about this. Uh, I find it very interesting that scholars are more critical of the, um, of, uh, the Pro-Evangelium of James, but Strangely enough, Proto Evangelium of James does not make this chronological error that Gospel of Luke does. It do, it actually doesn't say the census was during uh, when Caranaeus. It it just mentions the census. It doesn't say the census was under Caranaeus. So I find that interesting that this apocrypha is more historically accurate than the Gospel of Luke in this in this thing. He makes a lot of mistakes, but scholars say that if he he got mixed up with Saturninus. It could be, yeah. Uh, that, that Saturninus was the governor at the time of the census in 6 AD or 4 AD. Um, the other thing I want to say is the book that we need the most, and I hope we find it sometime in our lifetime, is Papias. We need yeah. a copy of Papias. That would be unbelievable. And I think if we discovered a copy of Papias, that would refute a lot of false scholarly ideas. And it would also create a whole type of, uh, it, it would just revolutionize the whole field of textual criticism and um, early church history and everything. Like that would be one of the most important books ever. Absolutely. And it's it lost. Unless he's a liar, you know, what's, the, the fragments from that have stories about the death of Judas and a whole lot of other things. Like the ones, the one, the fragments that are left are just mind blowing. Tell you the truth. And I have those fragments. I've read them and they're on a podcast. My podcasts, all of them are at jspresents.org. If you're looking for any of this information or you want more. There's some parallels in uh, Apocrypha too with some, with some yeah. of those uh uh, 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 quotes from Papias. Okay, you got time for one more. All right. This is an easy one. 
did the Apostle Paul exist since he was not mentioned in secular sources? I think I think we actually answered this question in one of our uh, videos uh, earlier this year. He uh, didn't mention in secular sources. I just mentioned one in Josephus, book 19 or 18. Okay, let's see if we got time. Try a different one. How about a theological question? Uh-oh. Why will a narcissist not ask Jesus for forgiveness? That's from was, was who who asked this question? I don't know who. I just have the questions listed. I have to go back and find out. Was it anyone on this call that asked the question? <laughs> um, a narcissist wouldn't because it's always someone else's fault. And they don't have a, a conscience. So uh, I've... I've told this before to people. I actually don't believe in the existence of narcissists. Uh, I think it's a, um, I think it's a arbitrary label that was created by uh, scientists to try to make sense of evil. Um, and I think there's, you can't really make sense of evil necessarily. There's no necessarily like rhyme and reason to it. Sometimes, sometimes it's random, and evil people have good in them. I know this for a fact. So. Okay, one more quick then. Because Jackson is pretty evil, you know? Yeah, but yeah. He's, he's good too. I've tried for entire sanctification all my life. You know, Wesley tried for it, and he said, yes, I finally found it. I was perfecting the love at the age of 86. How can Christians claim Jesus never sinned? According to the Bible, he did a few sins, disrespecting his mother and being a racist. <laughs> racist? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> He, he mentioned John 2, 3, and Matthew Samaritan? 26 as being a racist. That is so ridiculous. <laughs> Why honor that with an answer? Unless you want to. Uh, I'll answer. I, I think, um, you know, how do we define what racism is? Um, I'm going to say something controversial here. Basically, what if certain racist things was true? Would, would, that, would it make it... Uh, would it make it wrong to say it? Like, it doesn't make sense to say so-and-so said this thing, therefore they're horrible, if they actually are correct in what they're doing or saying. Like, for example, um, you know, like homophobia or whatever, uh, opposing homosexuality. Oh, by the way, your video is going to be demonetized now because I just said homosexuality. Oh, um, I have to clip that out of there. <laughs> Near the end, I remember that. Basically, um, if like uh okay i just lost my train of thought by making that joke um <laughs> it was pretty good but uh what was the last thing i said sorry can you repeat what i was saying uh, uh, something about demonetize yeah no right, <laughs> just, right before that uh, john has a eidetic memory so he'll be able to remember it well, if I can't remember it, I'll do a comment in the video okay. section. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to re-listen. It's about being a racist. Okay, there we go. All right, so being a racist. Um, so, for example, let's say, let's say um, certain races have a superior strength. You know, maybe... Uh, you're a racist. What was it? That's, according to today's secular definition, especially those on the left, that would still be racist, even if you're right. complimenting them. But if it's true, I'm not saying it is true, but I'm saying hypothetically, if it's true, you can't then say, oh, you're a racist. That means you're, that means you're wrong. No, not necessarily. You have to actually support your argument. You can't just, that, that's, a, um, that's an appeal to, uh, that's an ad hominem. That's a logical fallacy. You can't say, He's a racist, therefore he sinned. You know, that's applying modern values to ancient uh, ethics and culture. It doesn't work like that. Um, you have to prove. You have to provide moral arguments that stand the test of time, and not just. A, they're not just true according to our culture. Um, but like another one, which would be you know controversial, would be what if what if some races are more intelligent than other races you know that's a controversial one as well i don't believe 
that. I'm just saying, yeah. if, it was, if it was true, people would hate you for saying that and they would say you're a racist and therefore you should be rejected. I actually do know some people who believe that. But I, as I said, I don't quite believe that there's not really adequate evidence that any race is better than the other in the grand scheme of things from what I can see. Um, but uh, in terms of the Samaritan, it was not a racist issue. It was a, a religious issue. Samaritans, um, you know. Uh, he doesn't understand the story. Anybody, yeah, actually, he doesn't understand the story. Anybody can join and become Israel. It doesn't matter what uh, right. race you are. That's what the scriptures teach. Anyone. The Egyptians, it, it literally says in the Exodus account, a bunch of Egyptians came with Israel and they joined and became Israel. So. Yeah. So it's not racism, and you know, parents are not always right. Uh, some parents are evil. So you know, if you're if a parent tells you to go murder someone, you disobey your parent. You disrespect your parent in that sense. You still honor them in the sense that they're your parents. So you don't like do evil things against them. But there's nowhere in scripture where we are required to obey everything they tell us, even evil things. So. So, you know, in today's left, the definition is that all Caucasian men are naturally racists. And I've heard that uh, from politicals. I've seen that written in text on the internet. And I think that that is the modem of the way that we are living today. There's even a better one. They say... They say black people cannot be racist. Really? Yep. Uh, they say that. Um, they say that um, racism, by definition, is a minority being oppressed. So, because white people are not a minority, um, white people can never be. Uh, uh, pe minorities can never be racist against white people because white people are always in the majority, and therefore. White people are not being oppressed. Well, I thought one... That's what, that's what a lot of people think. That's not what everybody thinks, but there's some uh, uh, activists who believe that. One black guy I know, uh, who I know is a racist, no, I, I'm glad to hear that he's not. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming tonight. We'll try to put this up tonight or, or tomorrow sometime. And I appreciate you for, for participating, especially Mr. Carlson. And if you have friends that are interested in this kind of deep, deep, deep stuff, bring them on. Maybe we'll do a YouTube spectacular live one of these days. One other thing, Jackson. Um, I made a video about Edomites, the, the, the word, uh, if you have the word in, um, a comment, it gets banned by YouTube automatically as like a, a filter against Edomites? hate speech. Yeah. You, if you try to type Edomite in a comment, it will not post anywhere on YouTube. Um, I think it's because of the black Hebrew Israelite movement. Um. They created it into a, a hateful word, but I have a video up. It allows it in your title. You just can't monetize it. But basically, every now and then, I have a random person who tries to comment on the video and say that the Jews are are evil and that uh, they're Edomites and stuff. Yeah. And stuff. Well, that's all the racist stuff, you know. Let God sort them out. Good evening, my friends. Thank you again. See you next week. Shabbat shalom. Have a great weekend.